know, to think of Jesus as a spiritual master, to think of him as, uh, as this great monk that teach his disciples how to pray. You know, we think of him as, a, as the rabbi, the teacher, master, uh, savior, and, and they're, they're all true. But today we're prompted to think of Jesus as one who teaches how to pray. So here's a disciple who is watching Jesus, as the Gospels say, Jesus was praying in a certain place. So imagine the disciple just watching Jesus. Perhaps Jesus is just in a whole different realm. In the Spirit, there with the Father, in a loving, embraceful relationship, breathing his, his, the Father's divine breath of life, contemplation, mysticism. Jesus is radiating, and then the disciple just watching him from a distance. And then it says that once he finished prayer, this one disciple, let that one disciple be us comes to Jesus and asks, Lord, teach us how to pray. Whatever you are doing there, can you teach it to us? Like, like, I really would like to learn how to pray like you. Just as John the Baptist had his own following, his own disciples, and he taught them how to pray, will you teach us how to pray? So the main teaching today is coming to Jesus and learning how to pray. Now, out of that comes the famous Our Father, which unfortunately we often just go into autopilot and just spit out that prayer. Our Father, our Amen. Blah, 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 blah. Amen. We're done. Uh, and of course, we've been recitating that prayer for centuries, and we will continue to do so. But to think of the Our Father as almost an outline or bullet points that should be part of our prayer. So, when you pray, Jesus tells us, pray to God who is your Father. So, that's just the beginning. So, we relate to a God who is a Father, a loving Father, a good Father, a Father who wants the best for us. Now, that should change already our demeanor, our posture in relationship with God. God the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the powerful one, the one that can like, you know, strike me with a lightning, the one who could do mighty deeds, he is a loving father. Now, a little footnote here. This may present a challenge because for the most part, we all have fathers, biological fathers, who are perfectly imperfect for us. So I, am, I haven't met a biological father who is perfect. That also applies to mothers, to brothers, to sisters. No one is perfect. But indeed, everybody is perfectly imperfect for each other. But here's a challenge. If I have a wound, what we call a father wound, and unfortunately, we often project that to God. So be conscious that if you're praying to God and Jesus Christ asks us to refer to him and to relate to him as a father, you, you have to keep in mind your own experience of your own father who, who may need some healing and reconciliation. But when we relate to God the Father, you have to think of the perfect father. Okay? Now, prayer continues. So, one, when we pray, we have to do it in the context of relating to God as this good, loving, perfect Father. Then it says, the prayer continues, hallowed be thy name. Now, this is something very important about prayer. If you really want to go grow in the spiritual life, you want to become a master in the spiritual life, and all of us have the potential, and all of us are called to be masters in the spiritual realm as to teach others Something that is crucial for our understanding is that we are created to worship. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. But it is an objective truth of how we are created. We are created to praise, to worship, to adore. And if you're not directing that towards God, 
you will find your own idols to whom you will worship, adore, bend down, prostrate, and serve as if it was your God. Why? Because that's what we're created. So if you don't target all that by nature, whom we are created to worship, to praise, to adore, to the ultimate God, you will find others whom you will adore, and they will disappoint you, and they may mislead you. Maybe a sport fan, or a singer, or it could be a friend, or it could be your boss. We, we are quick to find someone because in our nature we're called, we're, 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 we're made, and there's something within us that needs to worship, praise, and adore something. Now, careful. If you don't aim that to the right direction, your life could be very unfulfilled, very unhappy already just lost in idolatry. Who do we direct it? To a God we refer, call, and relate to as a Father. So when you hear our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This hallowed, holy be your name. This is a call to praise, to worship a God. We praise you. We worship you. The glory that we pray every time we come to Mass is a song of praise and worship. Glory to God in the highest and peace on His people on earth. We praise you. We adore you. We, we should be waving our hands. Maybe we should turn into a charismatic uh, renewal of a spirit here and, and with tambourines. And, and If it helps you, then do it. But whatever you do, you have to recognize you're created to adore, to worship, to praise, to sing, to join the angels and the saints, and to aim that to a God who is our Father. How holy is your name worthy of praise, of worship, and adoration. Now, it's how be thy name. Here we have to have a biblical understanding that name means the person. Name is, is the mission, the purpose, the being of a person. We've lost that. Now our name is just a tag we put in your shirt and we can change it and even change your name. No, in, in the biblical uh, understanding, name is who you are. Your purpose. Your mission. And we haven't lost, maybe we should recover that. Your name incarnates your mission. Your purpose. What is your name? What does it mean and how it incarnates your mission and purpose? Well, that would be a good research and something to pray about. But in reference to God, hallowed be thy name, and who is he? He is my Father. We go back to our Father who art in heaven. And it says, give us this day our daily bread. And here is trusting and surrendering to the divine care of the Father, his divine providence. Here, give us this day, each day, each day our daily bread. Give us what we need, perhaps not what we want. Because often what we want can get us in big trouble. You may want to have a million dollars right now. You may want to win the lottery and get this big million dollars. But how many people have been lost in this world because they were so lucky to get a million dollars? The good it is to have the whole world and lose yourself. So, Father, don't give me more than I need, and don't give me less than what I need, but give me what I need, and I trust that you will give me, at the moment, when I need it the most, what I need. Not what I want, but what you as a father know is best for me. So, often the children want candy or dessert before a meal. Parents know, no, if you eat the syrup before the meal, you won't eat the meal. And too much dessert might not be too good for your tummy. Parents know. Our Father knows what's best for us. Do you trust? And can you surrender to Him saying, Give me that daily bread and give me the trust that you will give me just what I need. Now, the prayer gets tough. They're here asking me, Jesus, teaching me how to pray. Wow. Forgiveness. Forgive me, Father? As 
if I forgive others. Now here's a great exercise that feeds our spirit. You want to grow in spirituality. You want to learn from the master how to teach. You have to. You don't have a choice here. You have to grow in forgiveness. You're caught up in resentment and unforgiveness. There's a whole chain of effect that happens afterwards that corrupts your soul and corrupts your prayer life. From unforgiveness to resentment to hatred to violence to war to death to you just lost your soul. And it all starts with unforgiveness. You know who you need to forgive? Forgive. And perhaps don't do it for their sake. Do it for your own salvation. Because when you don't forgive, it really grows into resentment. From resentment to hatred. From hatred to violence. From violence to war, from war to death. Forgive. Not only you will be free from all the poison that wants to take your soul away, but then something beautiful happens. In the manner in which you grow in this virtue of being a person quick to forgive, it opens something in you that allows for this receptivity to receive the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God. And therefore, how it is structured in the prayer, forgive us as we ask, there's a condition, as we forgive others. So you want to become a spiritual master. You want to learn how to pray like Jesus Christ prayed. You have to be quick to forgive and ask for the Spirit of God to help you forgive because in all humility I don't know about you but when someone offends me forgiveness is the least thing that I'm thinking I want vengeance I want to get even I want what is fair and just I want to show who I am therefore because that's pride speaking in me so it's not to get caught up with it I have to invoke the power of God. Here's where I begin to pray. So, Father, give me. I, Father, I can't forgive that person. I don't want to slap them. I want to hurt But, Father, I know you can. I give you permission, Father, to forgive that person in, with, through now is the power of God flowing in me. So be humble. Recognize you can't forgive that person. Just the thought of me prompting you to think of that person you haven't forgiven. Some of you are already turning red and I see smoke coming out of your head. I mean, I could do that little joke there to blow some steam. <laughs> but that person you need to forgive. You want to grow in the spiritual life, you have to be free of the poison. The poison of hatred, the vengeance, the war, that's death. Then ask the Spirit, Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Empower me to forgive. You know what? I can. So you do it in me. What flows after the forgiveness is, and do not subject me to the final test. Here's a beautiful principle. You know, and this is the, the, the prayer of the Our Father, according to Luke. If you look for other gospel, they have extra words. The one we pray at Mass is, uh, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But this translation in Luke, in the gospel of Luke, it says, and do not subject us to the final test. Basically, is do not test me to having to die a martyr. The final.
final test, the ultimate test is when the moment comes that your life is in danger, if you were to stand for truth, if you were to stand for the faith with living, if you were to stand for Jesus Christ, if you were to stand for the love of the Father and trust in Him and your life is in jeopardy, will you take that stand? You'll be willing to lay down your life for Christ Jesus, for the truth, for the church, for the Father, for the people we love. Will you be able to do as Jesus Christ did, to lay down your life in forgiving others? In this context, now you begin to see the importance of forgiveness. It is crucial to the spiritual life. I would dare to say it is the exercise of daily bread which helps you become a spiritual master. You want to see a spiritual master? You will see a person that when they're offended, they're quick to forgive and find ways to be reconciliated with their brothers and sisters. That's a master. And that's what each one of us is called to be. Now, I finish with this because I may have given you a picture of, oh my God, I'm so far away from holiness, from becoming, I mean, just a beginner. You know what? I don't even know if I can even start. This little observation, I think, is pretty powerful. After Jesus goes teaching the bullet points, or the agenda, or it's almost like a syllabus. Think of the, our Father as a syllabus. These are the things that we have to grow in our spiritual life. Recognizing God as a Father, you praise and worship Him, you trust that He will give you daily bread, you ask the power to forgive so as to be forgiven, and you begin to exercise this power to forgive little by little so that when the ultimate test comes, you're free to even lay down your life in an act of forgiveness and an act of ultimate love like Jesus Christ. That's our syllabus if we want to grow in spiritual life. But then Jesus continues and gives a parable. You notice that parable? And it's a parable about, about persistence. So he's telling us, you want to grow in the spiritual, you have to be persistent. You can't give up. You have to persist, persist, persist. And not just persist in exercising all these bullet points that we've spoken about prayer, but you have to persist in asking as to receive, in searching as to find, in knocking doors as to receive. And what are we looking for? What are we searching for? What are we knocking for? The gospel continues. And then there's something very powerful. And that's almost like a... a it turns in a different direction, not to be expected. And, and, and let me just read it. And you probably will fill up the gap and then recognize, well, oh, yeah, he didn't say that. He, look at this, it says, uh, What father among you will hand his son a snake when he asks for a fish? Or hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? If you who are wicked, listen to the structure of how this is written, because I want you to fill it up what will be logical to follow, but it's not what follows, okay? If you then who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much will the Father in heaven fill up the rest? Give good gifts to us, his children. That will be the logical structure of that sentence. If you who are wicked give good things, then God who is Perfect, good, and holy will give you good things. Or you can even actually justify say, will give you even greater gifts. Or the greatest of gifts. Now we're talking about a heavenly God. He skips good gift. He skips greater or greatest gift. And he tells you what is the greatest gift. What the Father wants to give to those who are persistent in asking, seeking, and knocking for. And what is that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit.
the Holy Spirit as the ultimate gift the Father wants to give you. If you start, it says, teach us to pray, Jesus. And it ends saying, receive the Holy Spirit. You want to learn how to pray? Then you must ask, receive, and live in the Spirit of God. It is only in the Holy Spirit that you will be able to pray. It is only in the Spirit that you will be willing to lay down your life for others. It's only in the Spirit where you can cry out, Abba, Father. It is only in the Spirit that you can grow in a spiritual life. It is in the Spirit of God where you can worship and praise Him. You hear people say, I am filled with the Spirit. I'm living life in the Spirit. That's the life that we all need to have and therefore become spiritual masters that teach others how to pray. I created with this imagery to help us understand the, this great power of the Spirit. When someone passes out, any doctors here, nurses here, if I were to pass out now, or someone were to pass out right now because this comedy is so long, and someone is about to pass out, the first thing we'll do is, any doctors, any nurses here, call 911. And then someone, oh, and they're not breathing. What will you start doing? CPR. Okay, we volunteers. You volunteer? Okay, I'm going to pass out. <laughs> someone will pass out soon. Uh, so you're a nurse, I imagine. Yeah, good thing. Congratulations. Thank you. So, she will begin, if it's okay, and hopefully no one is offended here, she will begin to breathe life into me. In a very intimate and powerful way, she will put her lips upon my mouth and breathe her own life into me and compress me. Joyce.